Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Sarah, and of course, my colleague Ian Berry is also joining us, who some of you may remember from last week's social media webinar. Um, we'll be answering your questions this evening, um, so let us know if you have any, and we'll, we'll try to help you. And, and let me introduce Tom Baker of Talk Motorsport Limited, who is very kindly leading this evening's um, club webinar on marketing that will hopefully uh, give you um, some good ideas and tips and tricks um, to help you prepare for restarting the, the season and um, just build that basic marketing strategy, really. Um, just before we get started, I don't know, there may be some of you that haven't attended a Zoom webinar before. Um, it's a little bit different to a meeting. Um, there's a bar across the bottom. Um, in there, you should be able to raise your hand. Um, there's also a QA and a and a chat box. If you wish to send us any messages, ask any questions, please just write your messages in there. And um, yeah, we'll try and answer, we'll try and answer your questions if we can. And uh, over to Tom, I think. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so yeah, thanks for everyone for joining us this evening. Um, Marketing 101, very American. Um, I'm wondering if there's going to be an MS, uh, Motorsport UK Glee Club after this as well. I'm sure you can sign up later. Um, I'll leave that to Sarah. Um, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll run through a little bit about what marketing strategy and what, the, what you can get out of it. Um, the intention is for this session to be sort of interactive. So if you do have questions, then please feel free to ask during the presentation and we can then um, sort of answer those. Um, brief one, because some of you may be wondering who, who are talk and who is Tom Baker. Some of you may have dialed in thinking it might be the Tom Baker from Doctor Who and sadly disappointed now that I'm not, so sorry about that. It's uh, something that's troubled me my entire life, but there we go. Um, <clears throat> we were started in, or I started talk in 2010 uh, through my love of motorsport, basically. I'm sure everyone else sort of shares that, um, that passion for, for getting involved in motorsport. Um, I phoned up uh, one chap called Robert Parr Motorsport, who some of you may know, and said, I'll come and work for you for free for a year, and if you like what we do, then you pay me. And after four months, he was paying me, and it sort of went from there. So um, we work with the BRDC, we work with uh, Motorsport News Circuit Rally Championship. I think Darren Spann may well be watching, so I've hastily had to uh, remove any mentions of nice things about the championship, just to uh, keep him sweet. Um, but we do quite a bit with Porsche. Um, we work with GT Cup in the past, Team Parker, uh, Dan Camish and Touring Cars. So we've got a real sort of range of, of disciplines and championships and uh, and types as well. We've got Nationwide uh, Crash Repair, who we did quite a bit of work with. Um, so we've got we've got clubs, we've got championships, we've got teams, we've got drivers, we've got sponsors. So we kind of cover things from from many different angles. So so I like to think we know what we're talking about. So just giving a bit of a snapshot, of what what is marketing? So the Chartered Institute of Marketing, uh, who should know best, really, they say. Marketing is the management process responsible for identifying, anticipating, and satisfying customer requirements profitably. The key word for me there is process. It's not just a, we do a bit of it somewhere here. It's a continuous thing. You should always be uh, working along and, and, and working with your customers, your products, and, and uh, everything else to get the most out of it. It's not just ad hoc. I thought it'd be useful just to sort of run through what we're not specifically going to be talking about in this presentation because it's a fairly nebulous world. So all of these things I'm not going to mention. Advertising, content creation, CRM, graphic design, direct marketing, email marketing, obviously you're going to be touching on um, uh, next week anyway, um, and social media. But, you know, the whole point of this conversation is marketing strategy and, and just giving you a good uh, grounding and a good basis. And to be perfectly honest, this time is actually a really good time to be doing it. You know, we've, we've got the benefit of time at the moment. And even if you've got a full on marketing strategy and a team working on it, or it's just um, you trying to figure it out, it's a really good moment to take a breath, just reflect and go, right, what is it we're trying to do? What, what is it we're offering our customers? What are our products? How are we doing things? So um, everyone can benefit from just taking that moment and, and time to reflect really. So I wanted to make this presentation relevant to everyone as we can. So I've kind of just picked a few challenges that you may well be facing, whether you're running a championship, a series, a single event, whether it's circuit racing, autocross, rallying, whatever it may be, um, just to see if that's going to work. And by all means, if there are any challenges that you guys are facing at the moment that I haven't thought of, then um, feel free to put it in and we'll see if we can figure out <laughs> how we can benefit you. So promoting events is obviously the, the obvious one. 
recruiting new competitors, gaining sponsors, and growing the fan base. So what we'll try and do is over the course of the presentation, just sort of bring that round. So at the end of it, you can hopefully go, oh, okay, fine. I've learned something from this. So I did want to take a second to talk about brand as well, and just kind of how you position what you're about. Um, Sarah mentioned in the social media uh, talk last week about tone of voice and how you are using uh, that in your social media posts and how you vary that across platform. Um, if you watch that, you might sort of be thinking, okay, well, how do we find our tone of voice if you haven't done this necessarily before or this is quite new? So a good place to start is just look at who are you as a, as a company, as a championship? Um, why were you... Why do you exist? <laughs> Basically, every company always has a has a founder story. You know, Hewlett Packard founded in a uh, in a garage. Things like that. There's always a reason why the championship, the company, whatever it is, was started. Um, whether you thought it was a you could do a better job, whether you saw a gap in the market, whether you were competitors and thought you could do a better job than than the existing um, opportunity, whatever it may be, that's always your origin of of what. Um, what you are about and uh, and that sort of infuses what you do and, and going forward um simply values what what are the elements that uh make your offering unique and, and particular um and of particular appeal and core competences that's a wonderful marketing phrase that um you may think what the hell's that about basically a core, a core competence is the unique mix of the company so you might have a specific uh person who's got a great deal of technical knowledge or whatever that may be, they then infuse the company through processes with that knowledge. Um, and so that is something that, again, makes you unique, makes your company or championship unique uh, and stand out. So it's those kind of things that you sort of bundle all up into a big ball. Um, and that is your sort of brand statement. And you can get from that, let's say, tone of voice um, and, uh, and, and really how you communicate with people, how people view you. Um, and hopefully the two of those should, should match up. Uh, the fourth one I've mentioned there is positioning um, because there are so many championships and, and, and events in the UK, as you will all know. I think last count there was like 216, 219 circuit-based championships or series in the UK. So that's a huge, um, huge number. And that doesn't even take into account rallies, other events. So um, I don't know how, how many actual events you guys do every year it's about three thousand or something like that sarah um it? yeah i think it's there are three or four thousand yeah yeah so there's a lot and that's just in motorsport so if you start thinking of other sports and other ways people have of spending time spending this their um their free money on um there there's a huge opportunity for them to, to spend all that elsewhere so really it's it's quite interesting just think okay where are we positioning our brand our offering in the marketplace, whether it's just in motorsport or elsewhere, you know, you might fit um, as part of a journey. So if you're somewhere that, uh, or an event that people can come along and start out, you know, it's their first step in motorsport. So it's really important that they have a, um, a really friendly environment that's uh, encompassing and, and inclusive and allows people to, to learn from each other and things like that, and then move up, uh, move up through the journey, not saying that other championships and other places aren't um, inclusive and friendly, but it's, uh, there's a different balance and a different mix as obviously as the further you go through. So positioning and, and taking the time to think, okay, where do we fit within this landscape is a really um, interesting thing to do right now. So audience, the next key thing. If you sit down and kind of figure out who your audience are for, the, um, for your product offering uh, and who you're trying to communicate with, obviously competitors is the first one that, that comes to mind. But then if you start drilling down, you've got businesses. So you may have sponsors, you may have uh, partners in your event or championship that are not necessarily sponsors, but they're providing um, goods and services that are of benefit to you guys. Um, fans, very important. Um, but to what degree are, are they relevant and necessary for your championship um, to, to grow? And should you be talking to them as much? Um, and then also other stakeholders. You've got, you know, these, these are, People and entities that you might not be communicating with on a regular basis. However, you've got to consider that you might need to be talking to them. Um, there's government, there's local councils. If you need, run events that need uh, permits, for argument's sake, you need to make sure you have good relationships with them and um, 
uh, you're working with them, most importantly, to do what you need to do. Um, you've got the local community. Again, if you're running events in, uh, in the local community, you need to make sure that they are part and parcel of what you do and you're part of it and you're not um, sort of causing any, any ructions or any issues for yourself. Um, you might have investors as well. Each of those audiences you communicate with in a different way because the information that's important to them and the reason they are going to be buying your product essentially is different. So you need to bear that in mind when you're looking at your marketing strategy and your marketing plans um, and thinking, how are you going to achieve your objectives? Um, one little uh, element there. If you are sort of stepping out first step on this journey, one thing you do need to consider is, is data um, policy and, and GDPR. Um, I'm sure this is something that will be covered next week in the, in the email marketing one in further. Yeah. So uh, I will leave that one to, uh, to Sarah. Um, but it's, it's really important, obviously, that, that you're not annoying people by using their data in, in ways that uh, you shouldn't be. Um, if it's the first time you're, you're doing this, as I say, it's, it's how you approach, you make that first step is really important. So um, it's something we can have a chat about later, or as I say, I'm sure it'll be covered next time with the, uh, with the email marketing. Products. So this is an interesting one to sit down and go, okay, what is it we are actually offering our customers? Um, and again, you might have a range of products. The first obvious choice is the event, the series, championship, whatever it may be that you are, uh, you are running. You may offer hospitality on the side of that as well. Uh, you may offer a merchandise uh, and you may offer sponsorship packages, of which you may well have a range of how you've configured that. I've kind of simplified that particular element because selling sponsorship is a nightmare, um, as I'm sure many of you will know, but done in a very different way. But just for, for ease, I've, I've grouped those as um, like that. If I'm sure there are other elements on there that are unique to your offering. Um, and so we can always add that on there as well. But as I say, just as a, as a guide, I thought we'll, we'll go with these because they're fairly standard across the board. Um, what level and to what extent you, you use these products. Um, I'll leave it, to, leave it up to you guys to best decide how that, that fits your mix. Just going back to audience, Tom, we have a question from Brian Hemming saying, yeah. Officials and marshals are also part of our audience. Would the approach be the same in attracting volunteers and officials to your event? Very good point. Um, yeah, no, I think the approach would be different with them as well. Um, they should be a, a separate group on, on that mix as well. So yeah, no, well, well observed. Obviously, they're, uh, what you're trying to communicate to them and what you're trying to get them to potentially do and engage with you is very different to competitors, to, to fans and everyone else. So yeah, that, that's definitely something that... Um, you need to think about how you are communicating with that, that group. But yeah, no, well raised. I shall add that to the slide for next time. <laughs> so what I've tried to do here is um, rattle through how we can put this together. So you can kind of see, um, and I've gone through it a bit quick, so actually I'd like to <laughs> recap a little for anyone who's, uh, who's got some questions. But, We've got our challenges, you've kind of got a product mix, um, you have an idea of your customers, and then how you're gonna communicate with them. Um, so taking promoting event as, as the one challenge, your product there is the event in the series or, or championship. So as we mentioned, you've kind of sat down and you've defined what that is. You may run multiple events that are, that are different. So you might wanna think of this as going, okay, fine, well, um, I've got a different, uh, different audience for those ones, but we'll sort of just take, take one in isolation for the moment. So in promoting that event, you've got competitors and you've also got fans. So you've got two distinct customer groups there. So you have to think about what is going to appeal to a customer, uh, sorry, uh, to a, a competitor, and also what's going to appeal to, to a fan. They're going to be very different um, propositions that you put to people. So in uh, competing, uh, writing to a competitor, you're, you're gonna come up with a creative message for argument's sake. I won't go into detail about how you could do this. This could be email, this could be, um, could, be could be old school. You could send a letter to someone inviting them to do it or, or a, 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 um, a membership pack. It could be 
Facebook advertising, could be any number of, um, of elements, but your creative message is going to be very different um, from the other audiences. Simply with the fans. Um, what you're going to be looking at with the fans is potentially, you know, it's going to be a great family event. Um, it's going to be, you can have a fireworks display. Um, there's conveniences, you've got a cafe and, and concessions and merchandise and things like that. All things that they are going to be interested in, in um, using, buying, whatever it may be at that particular event that's going to pique their interest to come along versus the important things for a competitor, which may well be um, a good uh, entry fee or entry um, to the event at an early stage, if you do stage pricing for argument's sake. Um, sign up now and get a discount, whatever it may be. So they've got two very different messages um, for those two different groups. You might notice we've got um, creative message one and creative message three. What happened to number two? Well, there's uh, depending on how advanced you are and what you want to what you want to achieve. Um, a key thing is you should always measure what you're doing in marketing. You need to to understand what it is you've done, what the impact is. Um, otherwise, you just spend a whole lot of time and a lot of money potentially, um, and not really know where you are. So measurement really is key. Um, and there's a couple of ways you can do this. If you're, if you're really quite clever um, and you've got a good plan, what you can do is something called A-B testing, which is where you come up with two separate messages um, for the same audience. And then what you do is you measure the, uh, the impact of those two messages. So they can vary greatly. They can vary in minor elements. It can be, and this is something that big companies spend vast sums of money on, um, you can change the style of a button for argument's sake on a website or in an email it could uh, it could be green and rounded rather than red and square it could say join now versus sign up here and but that subtle difference could lead to a five percent uptick in the number of people that clicked on that email or engaged with your communication which could mean um quite a lot in further down the line so it's really important that you measure what it is that you're doing and the great thing about um MailChimp, um, the great thing about websites and everything else, certainly digital these days, is you've got so many opportunities to measure what you are doing and, and really be able to compare it. So you can get lost in data. It really, uh, <laughs> sometimes it can get a little bit too much. So you do have to make sure that you are measuring what you want and not going down a rabbit hole. But we have, you know, you've got all the resources there and a lot of them are free. You know, Google Analytics is free. Um, MailChimp is free unless you sort of sign up for the more advanced packages, but they give some really good metrics on what succeeded, what hasn't, open rates, click-through rates, and all those kind of things. So you really can drill down on how successful uh, your campaigns have been. The other thing that is really useful to bear in mind is timing. You might not want to do the A-B testing, but you might want to send two different creative messages to competitors or fans based on when you are sending those communications. So I'm not sort of thinking at you know, nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning is the best time to send a tweet or whatever it may be. I'm not talking that, that um, finite. What I'm thinking here is if you're communicating with a competitor, trying to get them to sign up for an event in, say, August, what you might send them now is going to be very different from what you might send them in three months' time after the event, trying to get them to sign up for the following year or for the next event, whatever it may be. The, the timing is going to be really... Um, critical as to whether they sign up for or, or they buy into the message that you are pushing. If you're putting out a message now that says sign up for this event and uh, you can get a discount or save, um, uh, save some money on tires or fuel or whatever it may be, right now that's important to the competitor because time is short. They've only got you know six weeks or whatever it may be. So they're thinking, okay, I'm doing that event. I need to think about tires, I need to think about fuel um, and all the other things. They need to participate. What you might communicate to them in three months time after the event may well be sign up now and you can sign up for, uh, for the event at the same price as last year or this year rather. So, but you're not, they're not as, as tied up in the logistics and the nitty gritty of the event. So you can see how the two messages are very different, um, and that's, uh, that's an important thing to bear in mind as to when you're building your content calendar, what are you saying at what time?
throughout that journey with with um, with your customers because as we said before it's a process it's ongoing it's not just we do a bit now and we do a bit then it should be mapped out as, as well you can so let's have a look look at another challenge just take a bit of water so recruiting new competitors same product event series or championship but obviously your key market here and your key audience are the competitors but if you start drilling down and go okay fine we can't treat all of our competitors as one group so you've got potentially novice drivers you've got amateur racers professional racers potentially and teams obviously these can change as to your specific requirements but if you start drilling down you realize that you've got different sub audiences there so what you're actually doing is segmenting that audience down and going right the needs of these people are very different again so you know if we just discussed it with competitors and fans the needs of a novice driver or novice racer rally driver or whatever it may be are going to be very different from a professional racer an amateur racer and a team um i'm not sure if darren's actually on but um I promised I wouldn't say nice things about him, but Darren Spann at, um, at the Most Sport News Circuit Rally Championship, they have a really interesting mix um, to use them as an example. They have between uh, sort of 80 to 100 competitors on their events over the year, which is a very good turnout. Um, and that's the nicest thing I'll say about it. Um, but uh, when you look at what they've got, they've got five different groups. Um, and there's appeal to each of them. The top group, they have... Um, R5, WRC cars, um, and some really top drivers who come along and do the events. For them, the appeal is it's an event they can come along, they can um, stay race ready, the team can be prepared, um, and they can really make the most of, of staying on top form. And, and so they are ready for their campaigns when they start in the new year because the Circuit Rally Championship runs between November and March. The appeal for a novice driver is going to be very different. Um, they are going to like the fact that it's a one circuit, um, it's a, sorry, a single venue event, so they can turn up. They know that it's a motor, at a motor racing circuit, usually run by MSV. So they know the standards are going to be there. They know there's going to be a cafe. They know there's going to be toilets. They know there's going to be showers potentially. So for them, it takes some of the... Um, it's, it's an easy and approachable way of doing it. It's, it's not as daunting as going and spending the, the weekend in a forest um, for a stage rally. So you can see how the appeal there is very different. So that would potentially change in the communication and the messages that go out. So the creative message to a novice, as we say, is gonna be very different to a professional racer, for an amateur racer, or for a team. So segmentation is a really, um, is an interesting thing to bear in mind. And as I say, a bit like we did with the products and sort of going, right, we can drill down and we actually have a number of different audiences. It's the same here. So let's have a look at a, a final challenge that we can run through. Sorry, I've gone through this a bit quick, actually. Um, so gaining sponsors. Right, so the product is now the sponsorship packs. As I say, selling sponsorship is, is uh, an interesting one depending on, on the level of money you're going for. But let's say we're going for a fairly basic, um, basic package here so we can be nice and, nice and easy and just put them into packages of one, two, three, four. The audience for package one is business one. Doesn't really matter what businesses it is, but what you've got to bear in mind here is you've chosen a package and you've chosen a business that you think fits that package, but that business is unique. So it's the same as a customer. What are they gonna get out of it? What you're pushing is a, is a creative message to them that you believe that they is the best fit for them. It's the most interesting for them. You believe it's something that they are gonna click on because you, you want them to take action on this. Um, you can't just do a sort of scattergun. One message is gonna fit all and go from there. So package two, business two, separate business. So the, the appeal for them is gonna be different. So you're gonna come up with a different creative message. Business three, we could be looking here at, you're selling the same package, but again, because that business is unique, its mix is completely different, its brand is completely different. What may appeal to um, 
to business two might not appeal to business three. As a way of uh, illustrating that, business two could be a uh, could be a retail business. So their their client base could be business to consumer. Um, for them, the appeal of being involved may well be running a competition um, uh, or something like that that's going to appeal to their customer base. So for you're putting a package together, you're you're bearing in mind your audience and what's going to tick the box and, and, and make them uh, say yes, because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get people to, to come along and, and buy into what you are, you're selling, essentially. Um, the creative message for, for business three, that could be an accountancy business that only deals with, is a business to business. So you've gone from being B to C to B to B. So again, the, the appeal of that product is going to be very different, despite the fact that it is the same package, the things that are going to appeal to that customer um, are going to be very different uh, from the previous business. And then hospitality, you could still be selling that to that same business, that accountancy business. Um, but what's going to appeal to them on the hospitality side is going to be different to the package side. So again, a different creative message as to how you execute that. Marketing is about you want people to buy into your proposition. Um, it's uh, if you're cynical, you could say it's sort of a, uh, trying to coax and persuade people to do what you want them to do. But what you're trying to do is present your product as the best option for what they want to do. Um, and if you're successful in doing that, they will buy your product. So, and this applies to anything. It doesn't have to be motorsport. It can be selling hats. You know, um, don't know why I chose hats, but there you go. <laughs> First thing that popped into my head. Um, <laughs> But you've got to take the time to really shape the creative message um, to appeal because as I said, there's no point in being scattergun here. One size will not fit all. Um, you're better off, if you're going to do that, you may as well just not bother to be honest. You're better off taking the time to go, right, um, this is the package, that, this, this is, sorry, not the package, this is the product. Who, what is my audience for this product? What is going to appeal to that audience in order to get them to buy um, what we are selling? Um, you'll notice that I've said value proposition and message. Value proposition, again, it's kind of a bit of a, a marketing term, I guess. Um, but also, all it is is a promise that you're making to the customer. You're saying, if we do this, you'll get that and you'll be happy. And the customer is saying, yes, okay, I, I will buy into that. I believe that that is what's true um, and to be the case. So obviously, you need to make sure that your value proposition is not something that is um, hocus pocus. It's not going to be something that... Uh, People are going to go. Oh, okay, fine. This isn't. This is what I bought into. This this is exactly what I wanted, and it does the job. We've actually just uh, Darren's fan actually has just sent a message saying that um, he's found. Obviously, you've just spoken about how that championship really works because people know what they're going to get, and it's you know quality, and it appeals to such a range of competitor. Um, you know, they've said that they found that once they have the right product and branding, the sponsors actually seek them out, and it becomes a far easier sell. Brilliant. Well, there you go. Yeah, it's all about sitting down and just figuring out how you can make that product and that product mix work for your, your clients. And, and you do have to go through and finesse maybe a little bit and make sure that um, what you're offering is, is going to suit them. But um, one thing I would say actually on that, as, thank you for that. That was a good question. Oh, good, 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 good reply. Um, now's a really good time to be talking to your customers. Obviously, a lot of people have got a bit of time at the moment. Um, and if you, you know, if you haven't already done this, then you've still got time to, to do it. But it's great to be able to take the time to pick up the phone or, or send an email or whatever it may be and talk to your customers, um, be they current competitors, um, old competitors, old sponsors, whatever it may be, and just ask them what they like and dislike about, <laughs> about what you're offering, what they think could be improved. Um, because as you say, you've got the time to, to really take advantage of the market research opportunity that you have and get that feedback because you can use, then use that to, to build it into what you're offering and, and going uh, and move forward. Obviously, you know, some people might volunteer some advice that you might not want to want to take on board, but if you generally <laughs> you can get a consensus of what people think um, about your products and, and maybe give you some ideas of future products as well, which is always quite useful. Um, you know, the one thing I would say is make sure, have, a, have a, a sit down and think about what you actually want to ask these people and what feedback you kind of want to generate. So you can ask questions 
in a consistent way. Um, but you can also always ask follow up and sort of get to get to drill down on on certain things. And, and I'm sure you would be um, amazed by the amount of interesting insights that people may, may have or things that you you didn't think of that now you have the time you can go, oh, actually, we could implement that or we could bring it in for next year or whatever it may be. But it's a really good opportunity to, to get that um, that insight and that customer research. So definitely do that right now. Um, we have another question as well from Andrew. He says, our sport operates on an annual calendar. What's the typical life cycle and duration of the marketing initiatives that you've been speaking about this evening? Well, as we say, it's a process. So you really should be looking at, at a, an annual plan. Um, it's very easy to go, okay, we run a series or, uh, you know, and it runs from March until September. Therefore, that is our, our time. But if you think about it, it really isn't. You know, you've got that whole year you're whilst the the um the racing activity may be taking place between march and september you've got a huge amount of stuff going on beforehand you're signing up competitors you're dealing with calendars you're um dealing with regulations you're all these other things so it really you should be looking at a 12 month um cycle here um and bear in mind that what you can be doing is gathering useful content during the course of the season to then be talking about during the off season. So, you know, the, almost the worst thing you can do is get to the end of the season, go, right, that's it. We'll see you in, th in six months time. Um, you want to be communicating constantly with, with your customers and try and get them on board and do more with you because that way you can expand. You know, if, if you've got a healthy and growing competitor base, that's a really good story to be pushing to potential sponsors. Um, and things like that. So you've really got to think about, okay, well, how, how, how many ways can I use this really? Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, a 12 month, 12 month thing. Um, and as I say, it's good to be thinking about what you want to be pushing during the off season uh, to make sure you've got the content or you've gathered the content during the year. Um, as a, as a little example, we did some, uh, we worked with Bath Motorsport in British GT and during the off season, we did a little campaign where we, made sure in the final couple of races we got um pictures of the tv crews filming cars we got pictures of people on their phones in the crowds when we had crowds um and people in the grandstands and things like that so we during the off season we could put out social media posts of um pushing i can't remember the, the, the exact stats we used but saying how the coverage was on itv4 uh, sorry uh, channel 4 how it was on uh, free uh, live on Facebook um, so each tweet or each post we had the right image we knew the message we were pushing and so we took TV we took social media we took live audiences at circuit and things like that all little messages that when you put together that's actually of appeal to a potential sponsor and things like that but you're just very subtly putting that out there but it gives you content to be putting out over 12 months rather than six yeah, that's a great point now. I know some events, um, you know, especially if you only hold, say, one big stage rally a year or one kind of main event, you may not think about the time, oh, we ought to, you know, ask our club photographer to get a photo of the marshals or officials or our safety car or anything like that. But as you say, when it comes to a few months before the event and you're looking to recruit your officials and you're looking for content for your emails and your social media posts and whatever, it's a great time to actually sit down before you get wrapped up in the event and think, what do we need content wise? You know, is it worth someone from the team just running out and going to service on their iPhone and just getting, you know, some marshals at a regroup control or just something that can be used to help recruit those, those roles. We don't really tend to have photos of marshals and officials and, you know, people that signing on or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So no, it's, it's even if you do run one event, I mean, you're going to be wanting to, again, communicate throughout the whole year. I'm guessing, because it's the same for everyone, the earlier you can get people signed up, the earlier you can get money in the bank, then brilliant. So, you know, soon after the event, you can be saying, okay, sign up for next year and, and get a discount, whatever it may be. Um, but those things, uh, absolutely, you, you need to be pushing it all the time. But then um, on the back of that, because you are communicating with people on a regular basis, that gives you a sales tool that you can use. That is essentially, a, you, if you are communicating on a regular basis to a database of customers, that's something that you can put in front of a potential sponsor and say, listen, we are sending out X number of emails or whatever to a database of, of uh, highly engaged individuals. 
in our in our championship so therefore give us some money and we can put your logo on on that email so you can use different angles um in in pushing this so, um, there's, there's a question I rattled through that a bit quicker than i thought so sorry i clearly spoke yeah. too quickly um but just coming back to where we are so what we we started the presentation with was marketing is the management process and, and emphasis on process which we've just highlighted with uh, sort of the the 12 month marketing strategy or marketing plan identifying so that is who are your customers um, who are your target groups how can you segment them down anticipating and satisfying customers requirements so have you built that product suite for, a, for a lack of a better term um, built that suite of products that are ticking the boxes for your customers and you've tweaked them in the right way to make sure that you are delivering maximum value to them and they are getting exactly what they want. One thing I haven't talked about is profitability. Um, and if you want me to talk about that, you have to pay me because we're a marketing agency. So. But with that, that's, that's what we're about. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, am I on? You can hear me, can't you? Yeah, okay, we've got a question. Actually, two questions. One is from David Thomas uh, asking what the reference is to the number 101. And I don't know the answer to that. That's that's me naming the webinar. Um, it's clearly very American. <laughs> Tom, Tom pointed out um, just when you refer to a topic 101, it kind of infers you're going over the basics and giving a an overview of it. So you can say no idea. Motorsport 101, marketing 101. Um, Every day. One. <laughs> Every day is a school day. We've got another one. Uh, says this is from Jane from BMMC. Um, says she's finding this useful uh, for recruiting marshals, putting a marketing spin on it, and she's getting some great ideas. And I think for sure, you know, while I was listening, Tom, um, the clubs, a lot of the clubs who, who will be on here will be clubs who run really grassroots events, and they need to up their game with marketing and uh, and two key audiences for them or three for me actually there's their existing competitors there's volunteers because one of the big things that comes back from the surveys that we do is that small clubs struggle with getting people to help on the events and to help organize events um, and so putting together some marketing spins to get those volunteers involved get closer involved in the sport they really need to think about that and from for me i, I well, I wrote something down, which is, and I, um, I'm, I've just entered my first auto solo. So I have a racing background and before that a karting background, I'm very used to that environment. It's very slick. It's very customer friendly and um, <laughs> sounds daft. But I don't know an awful lot about auto solos and I've, I've joined my club. I've joined a regional championship. The marketing that I have received as a novice has lacked it's made me question things. I, I think marketing for me is also considering the customer journey, particularly for new competitors and new volunteers and really holding their hand through that early part of the process. That for me is also part of that marketing mix. What do you think, Tom? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I briefly touched on it, I guess, um, when we rattled through, uh, where are we? <laughs> You talked about your, you know, the marketing to certain audiences, and the yes. things that I have received have been for they they've been the wording has been for existing competitors who know what they're talking about. When I've sort of read these things and gone, I'm not sure really. I don't what, know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. And, I, this was the slide I was looking for there. So yeah, we, we've in in segmenting that that customer base. Um, We've, you've got novices, professionals, amateurs, whatever it may be. Each one of those has got a creative message, as we said, because the appeal um, is going to be very different. Um, I use the event, uh, example of the MSN Rally Championship, but um, for you, yeah, you, you're looking for um, almost educational stuff, aren't you? And, and, and making it easy for you to sign up. You know, you, you've got to bear in mind that this person, uh, or you, Ian, um, you know, you know nothing about essentially what you're you're embarking on here. So it really needs to be um, 101 to, to come back at full circle on, on the title. Um, you need to, to be very specific in 
what you are communicating and not assume. And that's the, that's the key thing. If, if, um, if you as, as a, taking this example, if you as a novice feel that you're being excluded, certainly rightly or wrongly, because of the terminology and because the way things are being communicated, it's going to put you off. Um, we all, you know, we've all got experiences and stories of really bad customer service where you've perhaps gone into a shop and someone's treated like an idiot because you don't know what all the function are on a, on a TV or something like that. And, and so you go somewhere else where um, you're not going to get treated that way. So it, it's really important to bear in mind your audience when you are crafting that, that message um, and putting that across and making sure that what you are presenting to them is, is you know, be appealing. I've got another question for you. I'm very conscious that people are much more time poor than they were 20 years ago because we're hit by with comms, whether it's emails, tweets, online news, emails. And it makes me, I speed read stuff much more than I did 20 years ago. Where if I got an email 20 years ago, I was like, oh, I've got an email, I'll read that. <laughs> now, like uh, delete, delete, uh, yeah, delete, delete. How do you think that's changed the way that people do messaging? Does it mean you've got to be shorter, more concise, more to the point? It comes down to the platform you're communicating on. Um, Sarah, you and Ben talked about this um, last week with uh, with the social media um, talk on if you took if you're on different platforms, you need to bear in mind how people use that platform. Um, yeah. But not getting bogged down in, in the sort of specifics of how you are communicating. If you've got a really strong creative message, then people will want to, to read what you're... If, if you've crafted that, a message, bear in mind the audience you are talking to, then that content should be appealing to them. Um, and so it shouldn't matter if it's a tweet or if it's a press release. If it's relevant, I still believe people will take the time to consume what you've put together. So... Um, but it's just making sure that it is done in the right way. If you're sending out a press release for argument's sake or a, um, uh, a member's letter or whatever it may be, if it's longer form content, you still need to grab people's attention up front. You need to have a, a punchy headline that makes them go, okay, fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm invested now. And that first paragraph needs to tell them what they want to know. Otherwise you've lost them. So, you know, we, we still have very short attention spans. Um, but if you're delivering quality content, then um, you're onto a good, <laughs> you're onto, onto a good, uh, good effort. <laughs> Definitely, and I'm thinking as well, I know um, at the end of these webinars, we always say we will send you a follow-up email with a link to future topics, but it may be that um, just a, a basic writing for clubs, whether it's, um, I think we we had down on our list something about writing press releases, but if you would be interesting in a kind of, basic copywriting um, webinar or something. I'm sure we can organize something and get Ben and the, sorry, <laughs> I've got the window open. <laughs> <laughs> Urban living for you. Um, I'm sure we can get Ben and uh, my colleagues from the communications team to come on um, and to talk about that, um, which might be quite helpful. And we will go over some basics of that um, in the MailChimp webinar next week. Um, which is up on our website again if anybody would like to to join in on that and we have had a question come in from John Boot linked to what Ian was saying um, about I suppose describing things and just using the right language saying the hardest thing is trying to explain the difference of say auto solos auto test um, PCAs and targets how can we keep it like concise but informative and I suppose again if you're new coming into the sport you're going to think, what's an auto test? What's an auto solo? What is going on? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I read that and I was going to reply to John, but we'll do it verbally because it's easier. And my answer at the moment is I'm not the expert on explaining how we do that, but it's certainly something that we're going to need to address and we are address it, addressing it internally as part of our sport development plan on how we market from from most sport uk how we market these different disciplines to these different audiences but you're absolutely right i mean i know the difference between those four but i'm still learning about the different disciplines and the differences i think some of the terminology is not ideal but that's just me coming in green um my own personal position uh, not not necessarily most sport uk's um 
thoughts on that, but that's mine. Uh, we've got another question. Uh, so yeah, John, sorry, I can't answer that. That's something we're just going to keep on working on. On, on that one though, um, yeah. I know we have um, been working behind the scenes on some club guides, which do offer um, explanations and things to clubs, which hopefully once they go live in the next few weeks, hopefully, um, um, will simplify things and hopefully help you clubs in um, maybe sharing them with people who are interested um, so it will be a nice resource that is hopefully going to simplify and just um, explain to people what these disciplines are. Yeah that's a good point. We've got another question from Stuart Longhurst. To what extent should our market research be used to develop our products and appeal more to customers rather than just the promo message? Good point. Can I just go back one actually? Um, when we were talking about uh, length of content and short attention spans, one thing I should say is it's important that if you are communicating something, make sure you mention it in multiple places. Um, if you've got a, a press release, it goes on the website, but you put the tweet out, you put the Facebook post out, because as you quite rightly point out, Ian, we're bombarded these days by so many messages that if you just put it out once and hope people are going to get it, that ain't going to happen. I think on average you need to see a message 17 times before you actually act on it. So that's a lot of posts. That's a lot of tweets. That's a lot of activity. But the important thing to bear in mind is, and this comes back to sort of forming your, your content calendar, um, that's, you, you do one activity that can, that can appear on many different platforms. Um, and that can be your, add up to your 17 times. So I wanted to put that in and now I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> I'll go, I'll do it again. It says, uh, this is from Stuart and it says, to what extent should our market research be, should, should our market research be used to develop our products and appeal more to customers rather than just the promo message? My straight answer to that is, yeah, absolutely. Market research is key. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, I always think market research is something you should take with a pinch of salt. It's always very good to get the opinions of your current customers. Um, on the current product and figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, Steve Jobs is always a big advocate of not doing it because customers can't possibly see what you've got in your head for future developments and, and things like that. So um, as I say, take it with a bit of pinch of salt as to if you are asking someone about a product that you, you haven't launched yet, you've got to bear in mind it's very different, difficult for them to visualize what you're talking about. So I would say if keep your market research to existing products um, and existing offerings so you're dealing with um, something that is, is a known entity. And then by all means, take all that research and bundle it up and, and put it into your future offerings because um, yeah, you do get some, some great insight from your current customers. Um, so I absolutely use that. We've got another one from Kate. Uh, Kate Neal, how involved should we allow our competitors to be and how do we monitor that? The question also applies for members of the BMMC, which is the British Marshal. Help me out, Sarah. British British Motorsport Marshals Club. Sorry, I knew I'd missed the word out. BAS. So, yeah, how involved should we allow our competitors to be, and how do we monitor that? Um, I think you should always welcome them. In. The more you make them feel part of the championship or, or event, the more goodwill you're going to generate with them. So, I think that you should absolutely involve them as much as you possibly can. Um, looking at ways that you can involve them while still maintaining control is an interesting one. Um, I don't know if you've seen, but recently British touring cars have allowed um, drivers to take control of their Instagram account for two hours um, at, at certain points during the day. That's an interesting way of bringing people in and showcasing the personalities you have in the championship, which is always good because it adds that, um, that personal feel and, and, and allows people to connect um, with the people involved while still maintaining control because you get, the, you get the logins back after, after two hours. So things like that are, are a good way of, of involving them in it and, and making them feel part of it. Um, you know, promo videos and things like that, getting people to, to, to talk about what, they're, what they enjoy about the event, what they enjoy about the sport, things like that. It's all good because they feel embraced by the championship and, and part of it. So um, absolutely involve your competitors and your customers as much as you possibly can um but yeah just uh, just be careful of how you use it just speaking about um existing customers it's just um reminded me i remember reading a story of um of a club 
I think they were up in the north of England doing auto solos, but again, linking back to just the kind of very basics of referral marketing and just reaching out to your current competitors. If you're struggling for uh, marshals and volunteers, even offering a simple scheme as kind of, if you, um, you want to compete and you bring along two friends that can marshal, we'll give you a discount on your entry fee. Just anything like that, where you're reaching out to your current base, um, you know, they'll most likely have friends or relatives with an interest in the sport that they might like to bring along to marshal for the day. Um, and they just get a little incentive, whether that's just got on entry free or something else that you can offer them, whether it's free lunch or <laughs> something. Excellent. I mean, with motorsport, people love being able to get behind the scenes. That, that's a, the appeal enough, to be perfectly honest. You see the smiles on people's faces when you take guests and into the pits and the paddock or whatever it may be. And marshals get, get some tremendous access. I mean, obviously, they're there to do a job and, and uh, a dangerous job at that. So, you know, we thank them. But the appeal of them getting that close to the action is, is incentive enough, I think. So. Um, Andrew Bisping's made a good point, actually, which is the, the how-to guides, I think they were called. Um, I'll talk to you about it, Andrew, offline. Yeah, there were how-to guides. Uh, and it's reminded me that, that those exist, and I remember reading at the time, and they're very good. I wonder whether, Sarah, we should look at supplying those as, as a package to clubs to help them send those out to newbies like me. So when you get a newbie, a club can go, aha, it's part of the comms, I will attach this how-to guide. Not bad, it's a pretty good idea actually. Thanks for that, Andrew, I'll follow that up. Any other questions? If you go into the chat thing, uh, the chat box at the bottom, if you've got any other questions, please get them across to us now. Um, there's none more there at the moment. Uh, what we will do when we've got um, five minutes is, is actually take this. Uh, we won't bother sharing the presentation because it's just a load of post-it notes. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's going to lack the context of me talking and narrating along. But what we will do is put them into sort of one pages. So we'll have a, a, you know, one on brand, one on products, and just a few tips and hints from the talk today um, that, um, that you guys can share out to, to the members who, uh, who have participated just to, as a little reminder of, um, uh, of our time together. Uh, but also uh, uh, how it can, can prompt you when you are looking at, at these various things. Brilliant. Um, that's great. No more questions come in. Uh, Sarah, do you want to mention, after the webinar we had the other night, we've, Sarah has been working hard uh, together with the people who do the web, and we've got a link now for you to add data. Do you want to explain where that is, Sarah, and what that's for? Yes. I know we had some feedback last week where um, some of you and um, unregistered officials and people within your club weren't receiving our club newsletters and communications. So we have now set up a page on our website. Um, Arch, I'll post the link in the chat box so that people can see it, um, where you can just fill out your name and email address and tick which communication you'd like to receive from us. Um, from, you know, main newsletter, Revolution magazine, um, club newsletters, scrutineers, all the, everything basically that we do, um, just to let us know what you'd be interested in. And I'm sure there'll be people in your club as well that aren't on our databases for whatever reason, but are doing great work out there and may need to know um, any club updates and things. And there is a club newsletter going out later this week. Um, so if you don't currently receive it, pop yourself on the list. Um, I'll put the link in the chat box now so you can sign up. Yeah, this came up on a, a regional committee meeting I was on on, I forgot what night that was, Tuesday, I think. And uh, there were people on that who are involved in clubs as volunteers working in all sorts of different areas. And they're not getting our comms from us. So if my, my call out there to the people, the participants we've got this evening, please go on that website, make sure your details are put in, make sure that other people that you uh, work with at the clubs, get them to please go to that page and put their details on. Uh, Sarah's put the link up there, just copy and paste that into, into your machine um, so that we do start getting the comms out that we need to to all the people who work in the clubs in any capacity. Right, I don't think we've had any other questions. So I'll leave you to wrap up, Sarah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, well, thanks, Tom, really. Um, yes. 
um, yeah. giving up his time this evening. And um, thank you very much to, uh, again, all of you for joining us. Um, I hope this has been helpful and informative. Um, again, this, um, this has been recorded, so it will be up on our website in the next few days if you want to rewatch it or share with any club members or friends you think um, could do with some marketing help um, in the club world. And yes, please do um, fill out our short, um, I say survey, it's literally two questions, don't be put off. <laughs> Just um, our short questionnaire about um, upcoming webinar topics, what you'd like to see. And, and we're currently working at the moment behind the scenes on, based on what you've um, said, that what we can put on in the, in the next few weeks and months and keep supporting our clubs. Um, so thanks, Tom, again. That was uh, really appreciative from, them, from the comments. People have really enjoyed this evening and they found it really helpful. No problem. Thanks very much for having us and happy to share. Um, if anyone does want to have a chat, then um, feel free to give us a call. Uh, number is on the website, which is talktogether.com. Um, but yeah, more than happy to have a, have a chat with anyone who's got a few questions or whatever that, um, that we might be able to help with. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll link to Tom's website as well in a follow-up email. Um, which will go out, um, I think it goes out 24 hours after this webinar, so you'll get it tomorrow evening, ahead of the weekend. There we go, wonderful. Lovely, thanks guys, brilliant. Cheers. Thanks very much.